Hello, everyone. Good morning, Tara Mitglidef and Kadima, and unsere Gästen. Good morning to you all, Kadima members and guests, and welcome to this morning's event as part of our Sunday morning online Yiddish series of Yiddish culture and lockdown. My name is Faye Burston, and I'm the cultural producer of the Kadima. Before we get underway, I would like to let you know that one of our panelists for today's event, Danielle Charak, is unable to join us this morning. Very sadly, her sister Floris Kalman passed away yesterday. I would like to take this moment not only to extend our deepest condolences to Danielle and Floris's children, Naomi, Jonathan and Julie, and to their whole loving family, but also to acknowledge Floris's enormous contribution to the Kadima and the Kadima Yiddish Theatre. She was a committed Yiddishist and a wise and lovely woman. She was a generous supporter of Kadima's mission and she worked very closely with us at the Kadima Yiddish Theatre, translating several pieces, including Yiddish poems for our production last year of Funyan of Zeitlid, Play Me a Poem. She will be sorely missed by all who knew her, Kovid Irondek. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the Kadima stands, the Bunwarung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, on a brighter note, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Professor Re Rebecca or Rivka Margolis, who will in turn introduce you to the panel, including our international guest, Professor Joel Berkowitz, live from the US. Many of you may know Rivka from her wonderful lecture series a few months ago, Yiddish Oifenekran, a fabulous look at Yiddish in film, television and online. If you missed it, you can catch it up. The recordings are available on the Kadima website in our on-demand section. Rivka is the Pratt Foundation Chair of Jewish Civilization and Director of the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilization at Monash University. She arrived in Melbourne in February this year, just in time for lockdown, coming from a distinguished career at the University of Ottawa, where she held numerous leadership roles. She has a PhD in Yiddish studies from Columbia University and has written a prize-winning history of Yiddish culture, Yiddish cultural life in Montreal. Her research centres on cultural responses to migration and genocide, especially those focused on Yiddish, and one of her new projects involving, involves examining Jewish life in Melbourne. And I think it's fair to say her presence is one of the most exciting things to happen to Yiddish Melbourne this year. With that, I will pass you over to Rivka. Shalom Aleichem Alamein, good morning. Thank you so much, Faye, for that lovely introduction. It is truly my honor and pleasure to be moderator for this exciting event. This event is wonderful for me to participate in because it brings together my three loves and I think three loves that we all share this morning among the participants and um, people attending the session, which is Yiddish performance and scholarship. And it's so exciting for me to participate in this event presented by the Kadima Yiddish Theatre that celebrates the production of these wonderful podcasts. Before I introduce our participants today, I just very quickly wanted to point out how this event really embodies what makes Yiddish Melbourne so incredibly unique in the world today. And I can say this having lived in Canada and the United States, Israel and traveled and participated in Yiddish events all over, Melbourne is truly special. First of all, it's a beautiful sunny Sunday morning and we have far over 100 people here with us today to hear about Shakespeare in Yiddish. I find that absolutely phenomenal. Um, from what I've seen here so far since I arrived six months ago, this enthusiastic turnout for Yiddish is not unusual. There's a deep and abiding love and appreciation for Yiddish language and culture here that I find incredibly exciting. Second of all, I would like to draw your attention to the composition of the group of performers from the Kadima Yiddish Theatre who created the series of what Faye has very beautifully termed short and sweet pandemic podcasts for us to dip into and enjoy at our leisure while theatres remain dark. These offerings include sonnet number 18 and excerpts from Lady from um, Macbeth, Hamlet and Merchant of Venice. The presenters span multiple generations and diverse pathways into Yiddish theatre. There is a Yiddishist, an educator who grew up in a Yiddish speaking, Yiddish loving survivor home, two people with extensive pro professional backgrounds in theater who have helped to revitalize local Yiddish theater, and a uni student who is a graduate of a local secular Yiddish day school. This diverse and intergenerational commitment to the Yiddish arts and cultural continuity more broadly is a remarkable feature of Jewish Melbourne. Unfortunately, Danielle Charak, our lifelong Yiddishist and native speaker is unable to join us today, but I would like to say that she will be in our hearts during this session. I would now like to introduce the panelists for this morning. First, 
sc our scholar on the history of Yiddish theater, Joel Berkowitz. Joel is director of the Sam and Helen Stahl Center for Jewish Studies and professor of foreign languages and literature at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. A historian of the Yiddish theater and translator of Yiddish drama, he is author of Shakespeare on the American Yiddish Stage, editor of Yiddish Theater, New Approaches, and co-editor of Landmark Yiddish Plays, a critical anthology, and Inventing the Modern Yiddish Stage. He is also co-founder of the Digital Yiddish Theater Project, which is found at YiddishStage.org, a remarkable research group applying digital humanities methods and tools for the study and preservation of Yiddish theater. Professor Berkowitz is currently working on two solo projects, a study of how Yiddish playwrights responded to the Holocaust and its aftermath in the years immediately following World War II, and an anthology of English translations of one-act Yiddish plays. Welcome, Joel, to virtual Yiddish Melbourne. Our other presenters are members of the Kadima Yiddish Theatre. First, Evelyn Crape is artistic co-director of the Kadima Yiddish Theatre. She is an Australian acting icon with more than 30 years of experience in theater, film, and television. She has won numerous awards and honors, and her acting credits include her Green Room Award winning one woman show, Female Parts, and performances for Melbourne Theatre Company, Playbox, 11th Hour, Victoria Opera Company, The Malt House, and Shakespeare in the Park. Her te television appearances include Australia, You're Standing in It, Flying Doctors, Blue Healers, and Laid. Film credits include Dimbula, The Sound of One Hand Clapping, and she was the voice of the old you in the award-winning animated movie, Babe, movies Babe 1 and 2. In 2011, Evelyn appeared at the International Theatre Festival in Montreal as part of the group show Eckvelt, which also toured to New York in 2015. In 2017, Evelyn helped re-establish Kadima Yiddish Theatre, directing last year's play Mia Poem production at the National Theatre the sold out season of Yiddish Divas for the Melbourne Cabaret Festival at Chapel Off at Chapel, Off Chapel and was nominated for a Green, Green Room Award for her performance in Ghetto Cabaret, which was staged at 40, 45 downstairs. Second, Galit Klass. Galit Klass is an actor, singer, director, and writer. She is the artistic co-director of Kadima Yiddish Theatre. She studied both Yiddish and performing arts at Monash University before creating a string of solo cabarets. For Kadima Yiddish Theater, Gidlit has written, directed, and or performed in five productions, including Play Me a Poem, Shalom Aleichem, Not Dead Yet. She wrote The, Ca the Ghetto Cabaret, which, has, which was a sold out two week program at the Kadima in 2017, and an adapted production for 45 Downstairs last year that was nominated for four Green Room Awards. She went to and received excellent reviews. Galit has an unwavering passion for the important place theatre as an art form holds within any culture. Her vision, ambition, discipline and deep passion has, in a very short amount of time, transformed the Kadima Yiddish Theatre and, together with Evelyn Crape, they have created a firm foothold within Melbourne's theatre industry landscape. And finally, Joshua Rubin, last but not least, is an actor, singer, writer, and fierce lover of Yiddish. As an ensemble member of the Kadima Yiddish Theatre, he has performed in several productions on the Yiddish stage and has been in the development and production of production teams of others. His credits include The Ghetto Cabaret, Fun Yenel Zeit Lied, Play Me a Poem, both in 2019, Yiddish Divas in 2018-19, and the 2017 iteration of A Night to Remember, The Ghetto Cabaret and Sholem Aleichem Not Dead Yet in 2016. Josh is an enthusiastic member of Melbourne's Mil Kumen on Yiddish Choir, a student of history and linguistics at the University of Melbourne, and is positioning himself towards becoming a Yiddish teacher. I would also like to add that he is a graduate of Sholem Aleichem College, the only secular Jewish school in the world where Yiddish is taught on a daily basis. Zeit Bagrist Alamin, welcome to this session. We will now begin with two questions for Joel Berkowitz to set the scene. The first question, Joel, can you please provide a brief background on Shakespeare performances in Yiddish? Where and why have these taken place? Can you share with us some audiences, actors, and locations? Shalom Aleichem. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually Saturday evening here in the, in the upper Midwest, not very far from Lake Michigan. And uh, it, it's really, um, I'm honored and thrilled to be with you all uh, and um, it's, it's a nice 
sort of upside of, of this strange time that we're in, um, that uh, the, these virtual events are a little more likely to happen. And so I, I hope I can uh, come visit someday in person, but in the meantime, uh, it's great to be connected here. Um, Rifka, if it's okay, I'm gonna actually back up a little bit and, and do maybe a, a really um, thumbnail sketch of just sort of how, how we get to Shakespeare first and then, and then, and then bring Shakespeare in the picture. Is that all right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and also I, I, um, I, I know that some of you in the audience will know a lot of this story, uh, but I, I'm not assuming anything. So bear with me and it's going to be a very quick overview anyway. So Yiddish theater dates back uh, in the form of the Purim Spiel and actually other kinds of performance too, to the middle ages, um, but was an exclusively amateur seasonal undertaking uh, until the late 18th century when the Haskalah or Jewish enlightenment changed so many things about Yiddish culture and, uh, and a, a handful of writers, maskilim, uh, proponents of, of the Haskalah, um, started writing dramas and in other genres as well to further uh, that movement's agenda. And we see the influence of classics of European drama from the very beginning of, of those plays. One of the very first modern Yiddish plays, Leichtsinn und Fremelei, or Silliness and Sanctimony, cleverly adapts Moyer's Tartuffe to its setting in the contemporary Prussian Jewish community. But the phenomenon of explicitly adapting or translating works from the Western canon into Yiddish wouldn't take off until the professional Yiddish theater got off the ground uh, starting in the 1870s. When a gentleman named Avram Goldfaden puts together a, a company in Yassi, Romania in 1876, they start touring. He starts generating their repertoire uh, and they tour around Romania and parts of the, the Russian empire um, for the next few years. Um, after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 um, and pogroms and repressive laws that followed, um, Yiddish theater is actually banned a couple of years later in, in the Russian Empire. And uh, of course, at the same time, uh, the, there, a, a mass exodus um, starts happening, um, sending Jews of Eastern Europe to other parts of the world. So um, New York, um, as well as other centers, emerge as um, centers of Yiddish theatrical activity, New York being um, first and foremost among them before long um, until some other uh, cities and other, other places sort of catch up. Um, and a lot of the repertoire early on is by people like Goldfaden and his main rivals, Moshe Hurwitz and Josef Latina, a lot of musicals, comedies, melodramas, light operas. So then it, it, this is where uh, Shakespeare ultimately comes in. Um, in the early 1890s. Um, why, why then and why Shakespeare? On one level, Shakespeare was just one more source of content, which was very necessary. There was a relatively small group of playwrights writing for a rapidly growing audience that were hungry for new plays. And our modern phenomenon of plays running for weeks or months or even years wasn't generally the practice yet. Um, so the, the turnover needed to be fairly fast. Shakespeare was one more source, but of course not just any source. Um, in an Anglophone country where if a family owned two books, the second was likely to be a volume of Shakespeare's plays, Shakespeare was very much in the air. Um, and that air blew down to Jewish neighborhoods like the Lower East Side and influenced the cultural offerings there. Um, at the same time, regardless of where you were in the Western world, um, in multiple languages, uh, Shakespeare's greatest roles uh, defined actors' careers. Um, so when Yiddish actors, when professional Yiddish theater was still in its infancy, aspired to be their culture's equivalent of an Edwin Booth or a Henry Irving, an Eleanor Aduza or a Sarah Bernhardt, their depiction of Shakespeare's most famous characters frequently served as the barometer by which to make those comparisons. Um, and it wasn't just actors who were interested in proving their mettle with Shakespeare. There's a long global multilingual tradition of translating Shakespeare into other languages. And nowhere was this taken more seriously than by German translators. Since Yiddish is not only a cousin of German, but many Yiddish writers and cultural activists frequently turn to German literature and culture as a model, the famous Tieck and Schlegel translation of Shakespeare's plays provided a template in more ways than one. And the Russian born intellectuals who furnished the American Yiddish stage with a number of its most important early playwrights and critics had Russian and other translations to turn to as well. So one of those intellectuals was a man named Jacob Gordon, who had already been active in Russian letters by the time he reached New York in 1891. 
He claimed to be skeptical at first as to whether the Yiddish stage could artistically rival its counterparts in other European languages, but his encounter with actors like Jacob Adler impressed him, and he felt he could lead Yiddish drama out of the wilderness and toward the heights scaled by contemporaries like Henrik Ibsen, Gerhard Hauptmann, and Maxim Gorky. Gordon championed naturalistic social dramas and started writing plays in that vein that tackled issues like economic inequality, hypocrisy and corruption on the part of the rich and powerful, and the status and treatment of women at home and at work. One of his first plays, which premiered in New York in 1892, was Der Yiddish Lier, The Jewish King Lear. Before we know anything else about it, we see that the play's very title foregrounds the connection to Shakespeare. Gordon layered the Lear story onto that of the Eastern European family of patriarch David Moishelis. As in Lear, though David's wife is still alive, the patriarch gathers his grown daughters and their partners together at the start of the play to divide up, well, not exactly his kingdom, but his estate. He tells them that he and his wife are making Aliyah. And as in Lear, the two elder daughters flatter him while his youngest daughter, Taibele, expresses her regret at this development. Dovid angrily casts her out, setting off the chain of events that will propel us toward the play's melodramatic conclusion. With the Yiddish of Kanegliya, Gordon created the paradigm by which he and other playwrights would adapt Shakespeare into Yiddish, though it was a paradigm long established by other eras and cultures that made Shakespeare their own. Gordon cleverly mapped the story of Lear's daughters onto one of the central ideological divides in the Jewish community of his era, with one married to a Hasid, another to a Misnagid, an anti-Hasidic Orthodox Jew, and Taibala eventually married to a Moschid. That ideology frees her to go study medicine in St. Petersburg and ultimately return home, reconcile with her parents, and even be the one to diagnose the loss of David's eyesight. Yes, Gordon retained and reworked that Shakespearean theme too, as a temporary condition that could be cured with a simple operation. And so there we have the, the beginnings of all of this, um, where we see a playwright sort of specifically invoking Shakespeare, um, and this sort of opens up the, uh, the floodgate, so to speak, and inspires a, a wave of other um, adaptations and translations, which I'm happy to elaborate on, uh, Rifka, but I don't want to go on too long either. Thank you. That was remar a remarkable overview of an enormous theater tradition. And I encourage everyone here to have a look at not only Joel's amazing scholarly works, but also the website that he's involved with. <laughs> materials. Um, second question, and these are questions that um, I, I think are a very um, insightful way of leading into our conversation with our performers, um, is what performances of Shakespeare or other Western classics, um, theater classics, um, translated into Yiddish have taken place over the last 30 or 40 years, which coincides with the, and I'm going to put this in quotation marks, revitalization of Yiddish language and culture. So what has happened over this time period in terms of classics adapted into Yiddish? And what do you think has motivated these performances? And what might this tell us about um, Yiddish or whatever else, however else you'd like to comment on them? So between when Gordon introduces David Moishelis and company and, and this you know, more recent period, um, just to, to quickly survey that landscape, Gordon actually follows up six years later with Mirla Efres, or the Yiddish Kennegan Lear. So he adds that to the repertoire and that really stays in the repertoire. Um, and indeed, um, I, I would encourage people to um, scout the, the film version of that uh, from 1939. Um, made in the state with Berta Gerst, get in the U.S. with Berta Gersten as merely Efres. Um, it, it gives a, a lovely, um, you know, in, introduction to that film. I'm sure some of the people in the audience are are familiar with it. Um, we have Yiddish versions uh, from the 18, particularly the 1890s, um, beginning of the 20th century, uh, both adaptations and what we might call straight translations, more or less, of Hamlet and Othello, um, Romeo and Juliet, and the Merchant of Venice, in particular. Those are really the ones that, that stayed in the repertoire, um, as well as others that sort of came and went more quickly, like Coriolanus or, uh, or Macbeth or, or other things. And, and in Europe, eventually, we have really notable productions of uh, plays like The Tempest in Warsaw in the 1930s um, and uh, Shlema Mikhail Solomon Mikhail's uh, King Lear um, in Moscow in the 1930s as well, 
um, you can actually see some clips of Mikhail's performing as Lear uh, on YouTube. So those are still there. There was never a full film made of that, but there, were, there was some, there's some film uh, documentation. Fast forward uh, a, a number of decades to this so-called Yiddish revival. Um, and then, you know, people have turned back to some of those, those classics. Um, people have also done their own kind of riffing more broadly um, on, on some of those things. So there's the, the um, London-based uh, playwright, Julia Pascal, who has a very interesting play called The Yiddish Queen Lear. And it's not a sort of reworking of Gordon um, directly. It's, it's Julia's own um, meditation on Yiddish culture in Eastern Europe via her own kind of version of, of the Lear story, which is, which is really fascinating. Um, in recent years, we've seen some considerable success uh, by companies who have turned to playwrights like like Arthur Miller, uh, the Toit von Fura Salesman, is uh, the uh, you know, Yiddish uh, actually sort of dusting off an older translation of Death of a Salesman by the, the great um, actor uh, director uh, Joseph Buloff, um, who had uh, you know translated the play into Yiddish, um, and that that's been done with great success. Um, Waiting for Godot uh, has also um, been successful, and there's the the uh, you know recent um, production, which I know should have should should have been running in Sydney right now, um, if uh, we weren't dealing with this plague of uh, Fiddler auf dem Dach, um, where uh, as, as I like to say, it's it's Fiddler on the Roof in the not original Yiddish, um, but it's taking that material, you know, sort of putting it back into the the language of the culture um, that that Fiddler on the Roof uh, explores. Why do people turn to any one playwright or play uh, at any time? Um, I, I think it, it's easier to see that in retrospect and, and see um, why, why that might be happening. Um, but certain plays and playwrights speak to us at, a, at, at certain times. Um, and I think ultimately we can sort of look and, and see that. Um, for example, you know, Shakespeare is a good example of this. Um, a play like King Lear, um, in, you know, after the, uh, the English Civil Wars, when the theaters were reopening and, and people were turning back to Shakespeare and, and other playwrights of his era, um, King Lear was, not, was seen as something that wasn't suitable for presentation in the way that Shakespeare wrote it. Uh, and so it was sort of reworked. It was, it was uh, you know, brought in line with the, the norms of the day. It was given a happy ending because um, Shakespeare's play was sort of seen to be kind of punishing the, the good and rewarding the, the wicked in, in some way. And that's the version that remained on English stages for a good 150 years after that, until well into the 19th century. Um, so any Shakespeare play that, that stays in the repertoire or any other classic play, um, I think will we'll speak to certain moments um, more, more than others. And who knows what's going to be, let's, let's, God willing, there is a post-pandemic era, you know, what is going to be the Shakespeare play that we turn to, or the Aristophanes play, or the Sophocles play, whatever it might be, that we will feel, you know, really, really speaks to us uh, at that point. Um, the, I, I think there, there are specific reasons that translators and companies have had for turn, to turning to these, these particular plays. And, and I don't see Shakespeare um, figuring in Yiddish culture in, in let's say that, you know, from the 1970s to now in quite the way uh, that it did before. But that's not to say that someone isn't going to come along tomorrow and give us, you know, the great, um, I don't know, Henry VI trilogy in Yiddish or something like that. And we'll say, oh my God, this is the, this is the Shakespeare we've always been waiting for. Thank you so much. Um, and I would just like to uh, mention that we're going to have some time for questions at the end. So if you have specific questions, um, feel, please feel free to save those and Joe will try his best to answer those at the end of the session. Um, so now we're going to turn, now that we've had a bit of a, an introduction to Yiddish Shakespeare, we're going to now turn to our three performers, um, Evelyn, Dalit, and Joshua. And um, I have two questions for you as a group. Um, and I'm going to present the first question and we'll go around to Evelyn, Dalit, and Joshua. Um, your answers are going to be, unfortunately, much briefer than we would all like, just to keep this program uh, manageable in length. Um, but again, there will be time for Q&A at the end as well. So the first question, what drew you to Yiddish performance in general and to Shakespeare in Yiddish in particular? So we're going to start with Evelyn and then Dalit and then Joshua. Uh, 
Hi. Oh. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you, Evelyn. Hi. Good. Um, well, you know, I come from um, a family where my mother came to Australia before the war and my father came after the war. The only language they had in common was Yiddish. Um, so I grew up in a Yiddish speaking household, but they didn't want to talk to me in Yiddish. They wanted to talk to each other and they didn't want me to know what they were talking about. So that's a you know classic, well, one of the classic sort of situations for a lot of people that Yiddish was used between them and not shared with the kids. But of course, um, music, singing, featured very strongly in our house. So Yiddish is in my DNA. I grew up singing the songs and listening to them and knew all the, you know, they called me things like a Wilde Chaye and, you know, and the Zulik and all of those words that um, they called me, I grew up with and have inside me. Um, interestingly, I began my career um, with, with the beginning of an Australian theatre company at the Pram Factory, because at that time in 1970 and before then, there wasn't Australian theatre on the stage. And if there was, it was rare and it was usually done with English accents. So the Australian performing group at the Pram Factory was a reaction against um, you know, the English stage, which pervaded ours, and the American musical. So the APG um, was about embracing an Australian culture, Australian language, Australian stories, Australian characters. So interestingly, that was very important to me about my cultural heritage. Underlying that was the fact of my Jewishness, which kept popping up unbeknownst to me. Um, I was described in the very first play we ever did at the Pram Factory. I, one of the characters I played was a, um, was a madam of a brothel in our city. And I thought, I'll make her Russian. Well, the first review came out and they said, Evelyn Crape's Jewish madam of a brothel. And I was so shocked. I thought, really, really? So I think my Jewishness um, has sat bubbling along under the surface. Then I start to um, create shows where I'm singing in Yiddish. Um, I did it at the Kadima. Um, in 1998, I was asked to um, sing Avramel de Marvichel, also with the Kadima, and, um, and then the show that you talked about, Ekvelt, which we took to Montreal. It was all in Yiddish in 2011. We brought it back to Melbourne, 2012. Um, and then we took it to New York in 2015. So I've been sort of bobbing up and down doing, um, you know, Yiddish in amongst what has been also very important to me in embracing my, the Australian culture. Um, in terms of Shakespeare, well, you know, how in this COVID pandemic that we find ourselves in, we've had to completely rethink our program and um, in Ghetto Cabaret, Joel did Shylock's speech in Yiddish. And when we were thinking about what could we do, um, doing Shakespeare is a real challenge. Um, doing Shakespeare in Yiddish is a bigger challenge. And it seemed like a really good thing to do in terms of, you know, the whole sort of uh, focus, it seems to me, of everything all major theatre companies and, and musical organisations are doing is finding the sort of um, small unit that you can put up, you can Zoom, you can put up online that you can record. So um, that's how, you know, we chose to do the record the Shakespeare. Why not choose the great one of the greatest 
playwrights of all time, and do it in Yiddish. Is that enough for me? Yeah, Shane of Don Kevlin. Dalit, yes. what drew you to Yiddish performance and Shakespeare in Yiddish in particular? Well, what drew me to Yiddish performance was that I thought nobody else was doing it. Um, I didn't really know. I, I didn't really know much about the Kadima. I don't think I knew about the Kadima or the Jewish news or I don't know, but I had, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, I studied Yiddish at university. And one of the first pieces that I wrote uh, as a writer performer was a piece about my grandmother who didn't know any English. And it was a short piece about a granddaughter coming to accept and trying to understand her slightly crazy bother. And, um, and so I had to, my grandmother loved Yiddish. And so I had to put in Yiddish into this piece because it was so much a part of her. And it was the first time I'd ever performed Yiddish was writing this, writing this piece about my grandmother. Um, and then it became, I became drawn to the songs and performing the songs. Uh, I think most of all, I loved the nostalgia in, in the Yiddish songs. And after performing a few Yiddish songs, again, still thinking I'm the only person in the world that's doing Yiddish, um, I, I, st I started working with the Kadima because of Renata and Danielle, and it was like a slow progression into a life of Yiddish theatre, which I'm part of now. Um, and in terms of Shakespeare, I think it's fun to take... Um, to take well-known classics and when you, when you perform them in Yiddish, you, you experience them, you can interpret them in a different way. You start to find something else in it that you didn't know that you, that was more hidden in the original. It just brings out by, by way of the translation, um, brings out something else, something, I don't know, that's more specific, specific to Jewish culture, I suppose, Eastern European Jewish culture. So, um, I guess I, I was drawn to Yiddish Lady Macbeth because I just wanted to do Lady Macbeth. But also um, Macbeth, I feel, um, did have those, well, it has universal themes. It has the battle between good and evil, revenge, power, but also the supernatural. And that's why I was drawn to it, especially for Yiddish, um, the, the witches and the sorcery, the prophecies. And I feel that with Lady Macbeth, her um, imploring the evil spirits in Yiddish and going to the dark side is even more powerful because it's so dangerous in Jewish thought to go to the dark side. And so it makes her more dangerous and more desperate. So that's why I was drawn to that. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's actually a remarkable reading of Macbeth. I'm going to re listen to the podcast again through new ears. Um, Josh, the youngest member of the panel, can you please share with us your perspectives on what drew you to Yiddish performance and Shakespeare in Yiddish? Good morning, Elvin. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I went to Shalom Aleichem Shul um, in, for primary school. And there, you know, in the curriculum, Yiddish is, is a major focus. Um, but not only Yiddish, but Yiddish song and Yiddish performance is actually core to the curriculum. And some of my um, strongest memories are performing Yiddish um, at Shabbos assemblies or in the musicals. And there was always, um, there's always that, that, that song, that performance of Yiddish there. And um, after graduating from Shalom, I continued to study Yiddish and continued to dip into um, Yiddish song and Yiddish performance for a lot of my assessment tasks. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, then about five years ago, I, I joined the Milk Men on Yiddish Choir with Tommy Kalinsky at the helm, um, because there was something about that Yiddish song that um, struck such a chord with me when I was young and, and just continued um, to be a, 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 such a, a friend to my soul, genuinely. Um, and then, the Kadima kind of um, tapped me for um, the 2016 production of Shalom Aleichem, Not Dead Yet. Um, and since then, 
with Galit and Evelyn, I've, I've been uh, in and out of projects um, to do with Yiddish, which has been extremely exciting for me. <laughs> um, and in terms of uh, Shakespeare, for when we were developing um, the iteration of the Ghetto Cabaret at 45 Downstairs um, that Galit wrote, um, we were thinking about questions of Jewish, what, what does it mean to be Jewish? And Shylock's speech um, in The Merchant of Venice is exactly that essence of, I am a Jew and I am part of humanity also. And we just, we, we ran with it. We found a translation of it in Yiddish. And I think there's something about Shylock's speech in Yiddish that makes it a lot, it, it, I mean, it's, it's powerful already in the English, but it's just, there's this power that comes from speaking it in a language that is a Jewish language and asserting the Jewishness through Yiddish that is, that is so special. Thank you very much. So we're going to move to our second question, um, which is, and I think this one will go um, the other direction, Josh, if you don't mind starting again. So we'll do Joshua, Dalit, and then Evelyn will have the last word. Um, so number two, what was the experience of a short performance of Yiddish Shakespeare? So participating in creating these podcasts, what were the challenges and what was exciting about it? Well, for me, um, it was it was different because I I don't think I've ever been in a recording studio before, um, and uh, so I think uh, when I'm performing, um, I really like to connect with the audience that's in front of me. But in a recording studio, it was obviously very different, and I had to utilize my voice um, and and puling my voice, which was a challenge, I think. And also um, in terms of the context, um, because I had performed Shylock's speech in the Ghetto Cabaret uh, last year, but this time so much had happened since, you know, performing it in August of last year till um, coming back to a project like this this year. It was actually around the time of the Black Lives Matter movement when that um, really, uh, was was in the news cycle and Shylock's speech really struck a chord with me in that way because it is about you know the equality of humanity and I think in that context I, I had to reevaluate um, this this text um, so that was very very interesting and very exciting for me. That's remarkable. Thank you. Galit. Okay, I would say the first challenge, and then after that, I'll just speak briefly about the experience. The first challenge was the translation. Um, that's hard, we didn't have one. And I, I have to mention Floris Kalman, who actually helped with the translation, and Danya. And I'm, I think what Faye said about her earlier um, is really beautiful, and she probably wouldn't have liked it because she's very, very modest. And every time I told her that I was, you know, saying that she'd done, she'd helped out, she said, Gillet, you've already made me too famous. So um, anyway, she'll be really missed. And um, I was at her house translating this. So that's the first challenge. Now, when I perform in Yiddish, I feel like it just connects to a, com connects to me in a different way to, than English. So I connect immediately. I mean, in English, I have to work for it. And, but it connects immediately to my grief um, and to my vitality, my humanness. So I felt like that worked in the Shakespeare. Um, I feel like, like Hebrew is like the um, sacred language of Torah. Yiddish for me is like the sacred language of performance. And um, I've, the other thing is like performing Shakespeare in Yiddish is that uh, the Yiddish language itself is a lot more physical, so it bounces around your mouth a lot more. For example, um, the first line, De Robalein is Hazelik, um, compared to the raven himself is horse. You can hear how Rob has like the plosive B rather than raven, and Hazelik um, 
um, the, the fricative, the voiced fricative rather than the S is the Z. So it's actually a more active language and you can put a lot more of your kind of bite into it because of that. So that's, I mean, that's what I found was the um, experience. You miss a lot of the image, the poetry of the Shakespeare, clearly, but you've got that. Yeah. I love, I love that idea of yet that the association of Yiddish is the language of performance. I think I might quote you on that forever. Okay. Love it. <laughs> Evelyn, what is your feeling about the experience of what were the challenges? What was exciting? Well, it's funny because I slightly disagree. Uh, I mean, I think what, what is exciting is that, um, that Yiddish and Shakespeare, the language is physical, both of them and, and active and that as an actor you have to make sense um, often of what's not there that is what's not being said you get these fabulous words language you know language that tells you about action so the action um, for an actor is is great in both languages and the challenge is first to understand what it looks like English, what sounds a bit like English, but it's Shakespeare. That's the first challenge for me. Understand what Shakespeare is talking about, what the images are trying to do. And then you lay on top of that Yiddish. And then you've got a whole nother world to deal with. And that's great. What I, the excitement for me with to be or not to be, was that I discovered that Hamlet is Jewish. And he is Jewish because we ask questions. Jews ask questions. You know, the, the cliche, the Jews answer a question with a question. Look at the first line. To be or not to be? That is the question. Three questions in one line. When um, Hamlet's mother and uncle find him impossible to deal with, they call on his two friends, his, his school friends, Rosenkrantz and Gildenstern, to try and help them get, you know, solve his, um, his, his behavior, which is out of control. His relationship with his mother, yeah, you know, the, the Freudian, Oedipal relationship that he has with his mother. Sure, he's discovered that, you know, that his um, uncle poisoned his father. But what concerns him much more and what's there emotionally in those confrontational scenes between Hamlet and Gertrude is that he's appalled at this or hasty marriage that she hasn't waited long enough to jump into bed and marry, marry the uncle. And um, he puts her on a guilt trip. Those scenes are about Hamlet shaming her. And finally, this, this monologue, to be or not to be, for me is a kind of Talmudic wrangling. I mean, think of Tevye talking to God. It's not, this isn't dissimilar. He's asking the questions of a higher power. How, how can we make sense of the hell that we're living on this earth um, if, and, and, and act, either kill himself or kill his uncle, but know what will be there on the other side. You know, will it be a worse hell? What's he gonna do? For me, it's a whole Talmudic wrangling with morality, with religion. Um, and in the end, he, he doesn't have the answer. He doesn't have the answer to his question. So, you know, the great exciting challenge for me was realizing that, um, you know, that Hamlet is Jewish. He has a lot of, um, and, and that the to be or not to be monologue captures, I guess what, you know, Galitz just mentioned, there is enormous grief and, and, and that's why you choose even a monologue in, in Shakespeare is like an aria. It covers all the grounds. It's heightened um, in every way in, in dealing with a world that you have to, as an actor, uh, grapple with and solve um, enormous problems within three minutes. That's it. 
I would like to thank Evelyn Dalit and Joshua for your remarkable insights. Um, and now I'm going to invite Joel to um, make some final comments. First of all, respond however you'd like to what you've heard here, which I, I find a remarkable layer of commentary on what Yiddish Shakespeare is and can be. And then the additional questions, what do you think this project indicates about the potential for Yiddish performance of Shakespeare using new media? So YouTube or even the conversation we're having today. What directions can you imagine Shakespeare at a Yiddish community theater like the Kadima Yiddish Theater taking in the future? In particular around questions like drawing in new actors and audiences. And what do you think this might mean for Yiddish theater more broadly? Now, thank you, everyone. I, I, I really love that conversation. Um, and, and I'd actually like to um, draw people's attention. I don't know if, if everyone saw it. Um, question from Faye Kingsley. Uh, what is the point of translating English literature into Yiddish rather than concentrating on Yiddish literature, theater, or culture generally? Shouldn't we be working on enriching our and the next generation's knowledge and understanding of the almost lost world of, of Yiddish culture? Um, I, I think that as Ms. Kingsley was writing that, the, the actors were not necessarily speaking directly to it, but, but I think we're actually answering it. Um, and, and, and of course, I mean, and I think it's a great question and a really fair question. And everyone has, you know, who, those of us who, who work in various ways on this kind of material as, as Yiddish teachers, scholars, performers, um, whatever it may be, um, you know, we have limited time and, and resources and, and we have to think about you know, how we, we use that. Um, but the two aren't mutually exclusive either. And I think that, that our performers have, have spoken really eloquently about that process of connecting with, with Shakespeare. Um, the, there, there's, a, there's a bookmark on my laptop um, for an amazing website called Global Shakespeare's. Um, it's um, hosted, um, it's a project that, at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Um, and it archives and in many cases has full performances of productions in, uh, of Shakespeare, a, a, a 61 of them at the moment in English, um, but over 300 productions um, in, at the moment, 45 different languages. Um, I haven't even heard of a few of those languages. Um, and, and, I, and the reason I bring that up is that I think that everything that the, that the uh, Kadima actors have been talking about um, is, is part of that centuries long, absolutely worldwide phenomenon of, um, you know, not, not only obviously um, Shakespeare, but, but Shakespeare having a special place in this ongoing process of translation and interpretation and reinvention and, you know, that, 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 that I think is endlessly fascinating. And, and I think that that just demonstrates the continued vitality of Yiddish culture. And as Rivka said, in a, in a place like Melbourne, which I haven't had the, the pleasure of visiting yet personally, but um, know about uh, in, in various ways um, and continue to learn about, um, that there's, there's a place for that kind of exchange. And there's a place like Kadima that, 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 that fosters that. Um, to, to maybe pan out a little bit, um, and, and say and speak a bit more to the, the question Rifka just asked. Um, I'd say that Yiddish theater and, and, and as well as film and television are having a moment right now uh, with a number of uh, projects that have enjoyed considerable, sometimes even international, critical and popular success. Um, to name just a few, there are shows and films like the Israeli comedy drama Shtisel, uh, which has introduced countless viewers internationally to something that all or most of you probably knew long ago that Yiddish is indeed a living, breathing language as capable as any other for being the medium for telling compelling stories by and about the people who speak it. There's Paula Vogel's Indecent, which reinvents the story of Sholem Asha's 1906 drama, Gott von Mekoma, God of Vengeance, and in the course of doing so, explores the legacy of Yiddish language and culture before, during, and after the Shoah. And, and then there's, there's Fiddler Af and Dach, uh, which, which I mentioned before, and, and those are just a few. Um, and I know that Rivka has a, a great interest uh, in and knowledge about this, this subject as well, as I'm sure many of you do. So all of that, you know, that, that's happening at the moment, I mean, it, it, it generates a great interest in, in Yiddish and a wider awareness of it and, it. and it leads us to the present moment and maybe the future. Um, for anyone who works in the performing arts, the present moment is troubling to say the least, given how far we are from business as usual. Um, so many 
actors, musicians, technicians, et cetera, are out of work. And you know, we're all depressed and anxious enough, so I won't uh, belabor that point. Um, God willing, we'll soon have our own version, version of Gordon's character, Taibele, who will return from St. Petersburg or maybe Oxford or Hong Kong or Brisbane or wherever with the news that our illness can be cured and we can safely return to our theaters and concert halls. But whatever happens next, this event itself is an example of how we're finding ways to congregate online and share cultural and educational experiences. We're learning how to bring together combinations of talent and experience that can make a particular event work and organize events in ways that draw an audience as this one has and offer content that people find compelling as we hope that you've done. So what's next for Shakespeare in Yiddish? As I mentioned before, every culture turns to Shakespeare and by extension, any other playwright whose work spans ages, languages, and cultures in ways that speak to it. Which plays by any playwright will Yiddish translators and artists find most compelling as we move into the 2020s? And what will they do with them? Will they be translations, adaptations, full productions, excerpts, mashups, video treatments inspired by anything from K-pop videos to Hamilton to Zoom meetings? Um, I think the sky is the limit. Uh, and I, I think it will be fascinating to see um, how uh, organizations like Kadima and the individual you know, performers uh, here and, and, uh, and directors and, and other artists um, will continue to be inspired by this kind of material and continue to extend that golden chain of, of Yiddish uh, theatrical culture. Shane and Dunk. So I think this is, I think everyone here is in agreement that this was an absolutely inspiring and exciting and invigorating session and a wonderful way to start a beautiful Sunday. Um, so I would like to thank all of our participants. I'm Joel for providing the, the background and, and very, very um, exciting commentary and Evelyn, Galit and Joshua for sharing your perspectives as performers of Yiddish Shakespeare, which is I think something we need more of. We need to hear more from the actors and the the performers and how these processes work around Yiddish, new Yiddish projects. I invite everybody here um, to view the performances again, to listen to them actually, because they're, they're podcasts, to listen to them again through the lens of what we've heard today. And I know I will, and I've, I've been greatly enriched by what you've all shared with me today. So Ashenim Dunk, thank you very much. We're now going to open up um, for questions which Faye is going to moderate. So I'm going to turn things over to her. And before I do so, I want to wish you all a wonderful and thank you all so much for participating and for everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you, Rivka and Joel and all the participants. Um, there have been a few questions, but I think we've answered them. Um, there's an interesting comment from Kathy saying that there is a new, newly emerging development in the Shakespearean authorship debate that Shakespeare was in fact of Jewish lineage. Joel, do you have any comments on that? You know, I, I haven't, I, I'm aware of that. I, I have to confess, I haven't followed it uh, particularly uh, closely. So I, I, I can't at this point um, sort of vote, you know, yay or nay uh, to that. I'll, I'll have to look into that more closely. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, pop them in the chat, but I, I think that's about it from now. For now, so um, we are coming to the end of our, of our presentation. On behalf of the Kadima, I'd like to thank our special guest, Professor Joel Berkowitz, live from Milwaukee. Thank you so much, Shannon Dunn, for you. your time this morning, this evening for you. And um, Professor Rivka Margolis from Monash University's ACJC. Um, our beloved Kadima Yiddish Theatre Troupe, um, all of you, thank you for joining us this morning. And I'd like to thank you, our dear Kadima members and audience, for supporting us so that we can continue to bring you the sort of modern Yiddish cultural programming you heard this morning. Coming up this Thursday evening, we have Tommy Kalinsky and her final revolutionary song workshop in the series, Alta El Naya Lida von der Revolutia. And next Sunday at five o'clock, we have Yiddish diva Karen Feldman will be joining us for our first Yiddish parlor geek. Um, a shannon dunk, everyone, and bleib gesund and bleib stark. <laughs>